Hello and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome, everybody. It's really good to have you here at the beautiful Rasmussen Theater in the National Museum of the American Indian. You're in for a treat today as part of our Indian Summer Showcase Series. We're going to be presenting Mr. Arville Bird today, both at a noon concert and then later on this afternoon at 5 p.m. He'll be in concert again. So if you enjoy this concert, which I'm sure you will, please tell your family and friends to come and join us for the 5 p.m. And just so you know, uh, the concerts will be live webcast, so family and friends at home will be able to watch it live, and then after that it will be archived. So if you want to check out this concert that you've been to after you've been here, there's a link on our website, uh, AmericanIndian.si.edu, that can give you that information. So we thank you all for being here. Uh, I just want to remind everybody of all the kind of usual theater etiquette. You know, you're at a live performance. Uh, Mr. Arville Bird does uh, welcome photos. If you want to take any photos during the performance, you're welcome to do that. We just ask you to do that respectfully so you don't make any of your neighbors cranky. Um, and then after the program is over, at about uh, the program lasts about an hour. After the program is over, outside in the lobby, there are some CDs for sale, and Arville is happy to meet and greet folks out in the lobby afterwards. Uh, if you'd like to shake his hand and say hello or you know, have him sign a CD or whatever, you're welcome to do that. We do ask that after the concert, you do head outside and nobody tries to enter on stage, please. Um, also, please know that we do a lot of programming here at this museum. This Saturday, we have our final concert for the Indian Summer Showcase. It's a, featuring a band called Bamiwa, and they are from southwest Alaska. Bamiwa means encore in the Yupik and Chupik languages. So please, if you're available Saturday, come check out. They'll be doing a noon program featuring some uh, programs around the Eskimo Olympics, and then a 5 p.m. concert, and that concert will be outside on our Welcome Plaza. And you can always check out our upcoming programs on our website online. So, as I mentioned, we have Arville Bird, and he will be performing with a very dear friend of his, his wife, Kimberly Kelly. They're both really great people. We've had the honor of presenting Arville Bird here once before, several years ago, and we're very thankful and pleased and honored that he's here with us today. So I ask you to please join me in welcoming Mr. Arville Bird, who will be celebrating his cultures, because that's what this museum's all about. You know, we celebrate cultures here. Of course, in this museum, we celebrate native cultures, and many of our performers uh, are multicultural. You know, Arville Bird celebrates his Celtic culture. He celebrates his Native American culture. You know, you'll hear about that in the program. He's a Southern Paiute, but he's also, you know, from the great uh, isles of, uh, you know, Europe, where we have Great Britain and Ireland and Scotland. So you'll hear about that as well. And we encourage all of you to celebrate your cultures as well, because this is a cultural museum. So with that said, I want to thank you for joining us today and ask you to please join me in welcoming Mr. Arville Bird. Thank you, Vincent. And welcome. It's good to be back here. It has been a few years. I see some uh, familiar faces and some new ones as well. And you knew young fans, too. We always like the young fans. <laughs> and my daughter's here. Where's Shaylita? Where's Shayla? Oh, oh hi, over here. Hi, there she is. She's a resident of Washington, D.C. and a professional political photographer. We're glad to gonna have some lunch afterwards. Good to see you. We're going to begin with some animal totems music. One of my favorites, one of my totems, my inner totem, the bear. Mato.
Mato. Thank you very much. And welcome Kimberly. Kimberly and I have been playing together here, uh, performing together for the last year. And we have been having a great time. So she is playing the Irish hand drum called the Boron. She's also singing some harmony with me and playing the keyboard. So working her into it. <laughs> Normally, you know, she's backstage with the uh, promotion and the booking and uh, the website. And so, but uh, she's been very talented, multi talented person there. So, and she brings her Irish heritage to the stage as well. So, I want to welcome her here to the NMAI. Thanks, honey. <laughs> the bear. You know, Vincent said that I. Uh, bring my multicultural heritage to the stage, and that's true. I honor my Native American heritage as well as my Celtic roots with my music. And, uh, you know, these cultures shared a lot in common by both being tribal societies, which means that they honored heritage and defended it with fierce loyalty. They both honored the drum and the flute and had nature-based spiritual beliefs and warrior societies. And they both respected, honored, and revered nature, believing that the source of creation spoke to them through nature, that all things in nature speak to us. And the bear is both important to both cultures. To the Native Americans, they see the bear as going into its cave to rejuvenate, to come out strengthened, ready for, for life in the spring representing introspection, going within yourself to find your strengths that you need to bring out into your life for your survival and the survival of the people and your evolution. To the Celtic people, the bear represented that, that great strength and that uh, fearlessness. And they used the bear as a name to honor their kings, King Arthur. Well, the, the, the bear equals King Arthur and King Arthur Arthur's name equals the bear people. And so to, uh, to give a, a child the name of a bear was to give them a great name and great protection throughout their life. And of course, they went to the stars and they named stars after the bear, the great bear. Today we call it the Big Dipper. So the, the many things about these animals that uh, both cultures shared. I'm just learning more about the Celtic um, interpretation of these animals. But since we're here at the Native American Museum and they're honoring the horse culture, I'm wearing my horse shirt. This is a Pungo shirt. This is my, my fiddle is named Pungo. And this is a shirt made for me by uh, Suzanne Bartholis out of Florida. And uh, doesn't she do a fantastic job? I just love it. So we're going to do a song about the horse. The Plains Indians were receiving dreams and prophecies about an animal coming to them that they would be able to ride. And in 1540, the Spanish conquistador Coronado left for Teotihuacan, what we call Mexico City today. He came north into our great country with a huge entourage of 200 horsemen of nobility, 70 foot soldiers, and a thousand Indian slaves that were herding his, his goats, his cattle, his sheep, his pigs, and his horses. He was looking for the seven cities of Cibola, the seven cities of gold from Spanish legend, but he did not find the gold. Instead, he made his way to the Zuni Pueblos. He looked for the gold and stole everything from them that he could, and they told him the gold is out east just to get rid of him. So he went east, but he did not find the gold. Instead, he found the buffalo. After nothing but days and weeks and months of buffalo, he was thrown from his horse and injured and returned to Mexico broken and disheartened. But the Plains Indians' lives were changed forever because now they could hunt farther, kill more buffalo, build more lodges, and they grew stronger as nations. But many like the Blackfeet, Lakota had no word for this animal. The Blackfeet would call it Toshunka, big dog or elk dog. But in ceremony, they would honor it with the eagle feather. They would paint it, and it would become their partner in war, and they would call it Tashonka Wakan. 
the holy dog. So ride with me now. Feel the wind in your face and the power beneath you because this is the medicine of the horse, the holy dog, the Shunka Waka. represents power and freedom and independence. If you love the horse, his message for you is to find your personal power or reclaim it and break old habits that no longer serve you so that you can learn to walk in a new way. That is the medicine of the horse, the holy dog, Toshunka Waha. Thank you. So this is Pungo. Pungo is a Paiute word meaning pony. I got him off the internet for $75. And that included the case, bow, and rosin. Then I went to Walmart, got some white and brown and black spray paint. Took everything off, painted him all white, and began to add the pinto spots. Now here's his four legs, black, as you can see. Of course, they're stubby legs. Nonetheless, they have two stripes on each leg. That means he's counted coup twice. And he has two handprints down here. That means he's been wounded in battle twice. And he has three horse hooves, so he's been on three horse raids. He's got lightning on his shoulder for speed, and his eye is circled for clarity of vision. And in his horse hair, he has an eagle feather, gifted to me by a Menominee Indian fiddler named Louie from Wisconsin. And Louie was confined to a wheelchair after a stroke. He was a fiddler, a banjo player, a guitar player, a bass player, a flute player. And it was just a shame to see him paralyzed like that. So he gifted me the, the eagle feather to continue the tradition of Native American fiddling that has existed for hundreds of years. Although most people don't realize it. So this is Pungo. My Native American flutes that I brought here this morning, most of them, well, all of them except one, I'll show you one, that one later, are all made by one man in Phoenix, Arizona. 
His name is Pat Heron. Some, for some reason, I like people with bird names. Must be because of my last name. Anyway, Pat makes these fantastic flutes, and I chose his flutes to perform with because, number one, they're in tune with concert instruments, which is important to me because I'm a contemporary Native American musician, having studied classical music for years in uh, college. And uh, so, second reason is that they're loud. And if you're going to play with other instruments, you need a flute that will be loud enough to to get over. Normally they're kind of a soft instrument and uh, I don't know how his, he makes these to make them so loud. Maybe they have a bigger chamber here which means you gotta have more air to blow in them. Plus they look like a Nautilus submarine, don't they? Anyway, in honor of uh, Pat Heron, I have a song about the great blue heron. And this is um, one of my favorite birds. Because he hunts alone, he flies alone. And if you've ever wanted self-confidence, self-assurance, or the ability to be self-reliant, this is your totem. This is the bird for you because that's what he represents. They only get in mate and bring to come together in the top of trees during mating season. So their medicine is teaching us to balance our alone time with group dynamics as well. So. This is a, a song from the second Animal Totem CD that I released. And we have the great blue heron for you.
Thank you, the great blue heron. From the same CD as a when it comes one of my favorite animals. It's a, a song I composed to represent the badger. Now you know the badger is small, you know, but you don't want to mess with a badger. The, the Lakota have a story about the bear and the badger meeting on the trail, and uh, the badger wouldn't give way, which made the bear mad. So he went after the badger, but the badger grabbed him right on the right on the nose, and he wouldn't let go. And uh, later. They came along the trail and they found the badger and the bear, both dead. The badger had suffocated the bear by holding his nose and the bear had shredded the badger trying to get him off. So it just goes to show you. Let's go down with the badger. Okay, the badger's small, but he's fierce. He never backs down and he never gives up. His medicine is about the power of expression, the magic of a word, the power that a story has to change a life. And he lives underground, teaching us to look beneath the surface of things and people to know the truth. Here's the Native American food and the badger boogie. Oh, yes. So I love to do this for the kids because, you know, the kids are small. Sometimes they feel, uh, you know, they don't have any power. But remember, you know, just because you're somebody small doesn't mean they might, they still might have the bite of a badger. So, and plus, kids, remember, badgers are very clean animals. They always clean their den. They never, they, all, they always back into their hole, too, so they're always facing out. I love the badger. Kim? As uh, Vincent mentioned, we don't care if you take pictures. In fact, we love it. Uh, we really love it if you show them to us afterwards if they're really good. And videos are fine, too. We'd love to see you post them up on YouTube. Um, you know, any promotion is good promotion. So uh, don't feel like you have to get our um, approval for doing anything like that. You've got carte blanche. Like I said, as long as, you, as, long as we look good and sound good, we're fine. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> and we want to say hi to the people out in cyberspace, especially Thank a you. big shout out to Brother Don, and you know who we're talking about. Thanks for joining us today. I love Brother, Brother Don. He always ends his, his phone call with, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> love you too, Don. Okay, I'm going to do a, a solo flute thing here. And I'm going to use another flute. This is a, uh, actually a cane flute um, made by, uh, oh, I wanted to say, Ray, Ray of Island Flutes. Yeah, this is one of the Ray Island Flutes, and, and he gifted me this flute. I really love it. It's got a really sweet town. It's a little, you know, it's high-pitched, but when it comes out of a cane flute like this, it has a certain woodiness, a certain earthiness to it, and I love that. I've got a CD called From the Heart of a Paiute in which I was, took the flutes that I'd been gifted over the years by many flute makers. And, and nor normally a Native American flute is just made to be its own self. It might not even play in tune with other instruments. That's okay because it has its own voice. It has its own song. And so that's the way these flutes were. And I took those flutes and I played them. And I spent time with them. And if they gave me a song, then I recorded the song. And then if I would listen back and I would give it a name. This song was one of the first songs I was given by the flute. And I gave it the name Warrior's Lament because it, there's a change up in the middle of the song. I envisioned an aging warrior, a person that has faced adversity and danger in their life but gone ahead in spite of that without regard to his or her own personal safety for the help, well-being, and protection of other people. And he had served the people his whole life, but now he was old. He was in a wheelchair, and he, he lamented the fact that he was no longer able to be what he once was. But then as he rocked back and forth, he remembered back when he was young and strong and able to count coup among his enemy. Thank you very much. Now remember, 
that you do not have to carry a weapon to be a warrior. Anyone in this room can be a warrior if you're willing to be of service to the people, to be of service to your village. Today your village can be as small as your family, or it could be your job, your school, your office, your campus, your church, your organization, whatever it is, you can become a warrior for that, that group and serve them. Now I'd like to uh, do a song here with a new hand drum I've been gifted. I was recently in Dallas, Texas, or Fort Worth, Texas, playing for the, was it BNSF Railroad? BNSF Railroad, I got it right. And uh, it was, uh, they were, you know, Native Americans work for the railroad, and so they were doing a heritage day for the Native Americans, and I got to perform. There was some dancers and drums and singing, and, and at the end they gifted me this wonderful drum. So I just wanted to, uh, I've kept the tag on it because I wanted to tell everyone who made this drum. And so if, they can, if the cameras can zoom in on this drum, that would be great. Because it was made by Lynn Wozniacki. No, Wozniak. Lynn Wozniak. See, I don't have my glasses. When Lynn Wozniak. He has a business called Sweet Medicine Drums. And he is a, a Standing Rock Sioux Indian. And... Um, I'm trying to think, oh, the horse. I want to tell you about the horse because this is so cool. Um, this is the, the coming of the horse. I, wish I need my glasses. Hold on. I have my glasses. You're lucky. See what it's like? Okay. The design shows the coming of the horse from the European world to the Indian world. The blue wavy line is the ocean across which the horse traveled. The blue points represent a camp circle of teepees and the black circle is the Indian world, the hoop of life. So isn't that beautiful? Sweet Medicine Drums from Taos, New Mexico. So I guess I can take these off now. And I can see you just fine. I recently uh, read an article in um, um, Native American, what is it? It's not, Indian Country Today magazine. It was, it was one of the June issues. Now, I re highly recommend this magazine if you want to know what's going on in Indian Country Today. I mean, it has not only articles about what's going on here in America, but Canada and all indigenous people around the world. And that's what I loved about this article, because it was about a little tr tribe of Indians that live in the Amazon. They're called, uh, let's see, the Parajas. I pronounce it Parajas. It could be different, but I'm going with Parajas, the Parajas Indians. They live so far in the jungle that it takes a four-day canoe trip to reach the nearest town. They... Uh, were first discovered by the Portuguese missionaries back in the 1500s. But they resisted becoming Christianized, and today they remain intact as a tribe, even though the Christians keep going back and going back trying to convert them. This article was written by a man that went there as a, miss a Christian missionary to convert the, the Parajas Indians. And you know what? After three years, he was converted to them. He learned new values. He quit his missionary work. He, he quit the church. He moved back to uh, Massachusetts to study, uh, to teach sociology and teach the language or document the language of the Parajas Indian, which is unique in that it includes whistling, singing, and humming as part of their way of communicating. Uh, these people are amazing because they live in the now. They don't think about the past. They don't think about yesterday. They don't think about tomorrow. They hunt, they fish, they share their food, they laugh, they talk, they, they gossip, and they sleep happy. In fact, he described them as extraordinarily happy people. And this is a whole tribe of people that are self-empowered. They're not trying to be like anybody else. They don't want to be like anybody else. They, don't, they are proud of who they are. They love who, their culture and... What's surprising is they don't have any stories or myths or legend about their ancestors, which is kind of unusual, but, but to live in the now, you really don't need those. And so, 
You know, they are living in 2012 the way many people can only dream of, the way many tribal people can only dream of in the past. And that's where this next song comes into play. I was introduced to this song by a good friend of mine in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. Her name is Diana. And uh, she loved this song. Now I love it too. Written by Jess, Jesse Colin Young. It's a little known song. Okay, here we go. It's called Before You Came. It's probably written about the 16, 1700s. I dream. I dream that I was riding in a South Dakota field. And the sweet grass whispered to me as I rode. The sun, it was at midday, it shone hard across my face. And the land lay still in grace before you came. side by side as we watched a golden eagle fly in circles in the sky and we smiled as our eyes met for we could not hide our joy it was good to be alive before you came Sister, take my hand And we will walk this magic land Together Brother, look on high And you will see the storms are building And when the day was dying, we had reached the sacred hills. And the sun, it was on fire, and all the land was still. It was there, all wrapped in blankets, that in our younger days, we listened. And we fasted, for the night would bring us visions before you came. Brother, take a stand and we will hold our Father's land together. Sister, look Scars are building in your ground. Whoa, do you hear the sound? I dreamed that I was riding in a South Dakota field, and the sweet grass whispered to me as I rode. 
And the sun, it was at midday It shone hard across my face And the land lay still in grace It was a crystal solid place Before you came That could be a song about Crazy Horse, you know. Talking about the sacred hills and the scars on the land, which are the mines. The people were digging holes into the ground there to find gold. I have a song about Crazy Horse from a CD called Ride Indian Ride. It's about the same time, time frame. But it's, it's about a battle, a battle in which for the first time, Crazy Horse became a leader, a war chief. He was chosen to leave a small group of decoys to lure the army into a trap that, they were, that the Cheyenne and Lakota were going to set. Now, this battle took place 10 years before the Battle of Little Bighorn, but it was also a decisive victory for the Lakota and the Cheyenne nations. It was the first time they actually fought like the U.S. Army. Before that, you know, the young braves, when they would go into battle, when they would fight against tribes, it, would always, it wasn't always about killing your enemy. It was about proving one's bravery and courage. It was about counting coup. It was about earning that eagle feather. But they began to see that fighting an organized army like the U.S. was more about body count than it was about proving bravery. So the, the warrior society called the Akasita would hold back the young braves from rushing out and getting themselves killed so that they could fight as a unit. Now this battle took place in the dead of winter when it was so cold, the Lakota referred to it as the month of popping trees. And imagine riding bareback on a horse without horse hooves on icy slopes, maintaining your balance while you shoot your rifle without holding onto your horse. You know, you and your horse have to become one at that point. And the horse is very intuitive. And if you have a, a good enough, close enough relationship with your horse, your horse will know what you want to do. The army refers to this battle, however, as Fetterman's defeat because it was under the command of Colonel Fetterman that nearly 100 soldiers were led five miles away from the safety and reinforcements of their fort. He disobeyed orders not to go more than two miles. But he was a man that had boasted before that he could take a hundred soldiers and ride through the heart of Lakota territory and with a month they'd all surrender to him. So you can imagine when he saw ten little Indians keep getting away, that he would keep going and going and going and going out of frustration and anger. Now the Lakota referred to it as the, as the battle of a hundred in the hand because of the vision a medicine man had in which he saw a hundred Blue coats fall into the hand of a Lakota. That wasn't his first vision, though, you know. His first vision was he saw five soldiers. They said, that's not enough. Go back and have another vision. So he came back and said, okay, I saw 20 soldiers. That's not enough. Go back and have another vision. Well, finally he came back and he had 100 soldiers, and that was enough for them. Now, in the beginning here, I'm going to speak some words in my native language of Southern Paiute as I understand them. And in these words, I'm going to say to you, Hello, Indian people. How are you? Thank you for coming. Now sit closer and listen to my song. Like when they're woodsing, I don't want to name. Aia, Wahani Akado, Nunca Kakahaban. On the Bozeman Trail in the Powder River Country, near Buffalo Creek and the Bighorn Mountains, 
Fort Bill Kearney stood in clear violation of Lakota Treaty. Ten warriors rode onto the icy slopes of December 21st, the decoys in the month of poppin' trees. Crazy horse riding back and forth, luring soldiers to the trap, hundred in the hand. The Lakota warriors were, his enemies are afraid of his horses, American horse, he dog, Lone Bear, and Little Hawk, the younger brother of Crazy Horse. The two Cheyenne were Bird Ash and Big Nose, all handpicked by Crazy Horse to be the decoys in the battle of Hundred in the Hand. Crazy Horse riding back and forth, luring soldiers to the trap, Hundred in He hunted here as a boy and a man The shining mountains, the powder river Then miners came and brought the wagon wheel In the heart of everything The Black Hills Crazy horse riding back and forth Luring soldiers to the trap Hundred in the hand. <laughs> I think we only have time for one more song, and so uh, does anybody here have a smartphone or iPhone? Anybody? Smartphone, Android, iPhone? Oh boy, looks like we got here just in time. <laughs> uh, if you've got your iPhone or smartphone, uh, you can go to facebook.com forward slash the Arvel Bird and like him, and then you can get updates and communicate with him on Facebook. Um, otherwise, you can visit us on www.arvelbird.com. Thank you, Kimberly. And you know, I'm glad I, I have her with me because without her, I'd just keep going and going and going. <laughs> like the Energizer Bunny. Why don't you pick up your boron okay. and we'll, we'll wind things up here with a, a song to honor the Celtic side of my heritage and Kim's heritage and do a song from our Celtic CD called Celtic Nation. And this is one that we love to do and the critics have dubbed it they called it uh, orchestral rock. And we call it fire and stone.
Thank you. There'll be more Celtic music at 5 o'clock, so come on back. <laughs>